I'm trying to get hate mail. I don't know if you've noticed this these past few episodes. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the Eastern storytelling format Kisho Tin Kits and its applications to game mechanics and narratives. Plus, Jim talks near automata and the crew responds to a new inbox. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 98 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today's topic is going to be an interesting one. We're talking about Kisho Tenkets. Um, thank you. <laughs> this is actually a, um, a traditional Japanese um, storytelling uh, format or structure. Uh, it comes originally from a Chinese uh poem structure, which is uh, kind of where, that, where it was adapted from. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about it because I had some interesting experiences these past few weeks with running into this, either directly or indirectly, and um, I think that actually it has some interesting applications for gaming, it kind of in contrast to you know the three-act story structure that we often talk about, or Freytax Triangle, I think will be an interesting thing to explore. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So, I have now, after playing through Near Automata lately, a um, very interesting game that came out. Uh, it's a kind of an RPG, an action RPG, mm-hmm. from Platinum Games, which um, you may remember from the Bayonetta series. And uh, Near Automata, it's essentially this game where. Uh, it, it, it is the, the third one in this like, beautiful apocalypse uh, trilogy that came out recently that Doc, uh, Doc likes to coin that term. But essentially we have uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Nier is the latest one. So you, it takes place in the far future, and I'm talking 100,000 years into the future, possibly longer. That's silly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna but the, that the basic, <laughs> yeah. basic, the basic <laughs> idea <Luke> here... <laughs> right. The basic idea here is that... Um, there are no humans on planet Earth. Um, there was an apocalyptic event where um, the humans had to, the, the few remaining humans had to escape to the moon. And um, their quote unquote children of a sort, the androids, stuck around. Um, and the uh, aliens, there were aliens that attacked the Earth basically and kind of destroyed it and took it over with these machine life forms. Oh, okay. So the humans are trying to. Um, or the androids, rather, are representing the humans in trying to take back the Earth from the machine life forms. How bad does it have to be to make the moon look like a good real estate? I mean, come on! Well, the Earth is completely taken over by by machines at this point. Wow. To the point where these extremely advanced androids have trouble fighting the machines. So what I kind of wanted to talk about when it comes to Nier, um, several things. Um, It's narrative, the gameplay, and just kind of how it subverts your expectations of what a game is or what, what an action RPG is or mm-hmm. how you tell stories in games. Um, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this as well, Doc, just because I know you're a big story guy when it comes to games. Yeah. Especially um, story visualizations. I love that idea. Yes. So in particular in this game, um, it has multiple gameplay types, I should say, or perspectives. So you have the typical over-the-shoulder um, 3D combat system, you know, action system, sure. which plays very much like Bayonetta. If you're not familiar with Bayonetta, something like a Devil May Cry, that kind of setup, mm-hmm. where it's, it's you know, action-based. You have you know, just a couple of buttons, a, a light a light attack and a heavy attack. You can swap out your weapons to, you know, have different combos. You combo between the two of them. You can um, evade attacks. You can counter attacks, you know, things like that. So it's very, it's very basic and, and actually pretty intuitive. But they also mix in... Um, what is essentially a uh, rail shooter or a um, kind of a shoot 'em up game where you you're I think I called the bullet hell last the time the bullet hell yeah. yeah and it does this in two different modes actually there's a couple of different versions of the bullet hell there's the you are a ship that fly that flies around that shoots bullets you can transform into a mecha from that ship um, and as the mecha you have a you you don't just fire bullets you also have a sword 
and you you have a multi multi directional way to control your character. So sort of like hmm. think think asteroids. Okay. And then um, when you're in the hacking space, it takes on almost exactly like asteroids, where you're this little you know ship in this like kind of retro inspired space. <laughs> And you, you, you can spin around and choose the direction that you're shooting, and you have to avoid being hit by bullets and such. Um, and so these are the different sort of gameplay. Uh, not, but not just there. They're also, as you're doing the, the 3D action combat elements, it will swap perspective on you when it feels like it's justified for either the environment that you're in or um, to up the intensity of battles. Mm-hmm. So, for example, usually it's like kind of the free roam over the shoulder 3D. Like I said, you can rotate the camera. But sometimes it swaps to side-scrolling. You're just your your camera's locked on, on to face the character, and you're, it's now essentially a side scroller action game. Wow! And it's just two dimensional in terms of combat, like eight bit or sixteen bit type mm-hmm. running guns. Sure. And then sometimes it switches to a top down perspective where you're doing the same thing, but now it's just top down, and it's kind of it kind of takes a similar style to the um, when you're in the mecha mode mm-hmm. where you can kind of spin all around, except you're still using your normal weapons, which are your melee weapons. Um, like swords and axes and stuff like that. So what what I think is interesting is that this game just took all of these different gameplay styles, and I actually think they all work pretty well. The most refined, of course, being the the one that you use the most, um, the over the shoulder typical action game, Bayonetta, Devil May Cry type setup. But it it uses these like tactfully, like it, it sort of peppers them in where it feels like it's going to have the most emotional resonance because a big uh, part of this game is they want you to kind of be taken on this emotional ride and the designer is very clear about this is what this is this is the feelings that he wants you to have so it is not an open game in the sense of breath of the wild that we talked about where they create a system and you are going to um experiment within that system and tell your own story sure yeah this is the opposite they're trying to get you to tell a story but instead of feeling like it's railroading you because that you're just jumping from cutscene to cutscene not that there aren't a few cutscenes but instead of feeling like it's railroading you, instead they're using different um, gameplay types and also different restrictions on the gameplay so that you're experiencing things emotionally in the way that they want you to experience it. Hmm. So it, v- it very much feels like a um, like a director's vision sort of thing, and it's like it's it's they're taking you through his vision. The option that it gives you, because I found it really interesting what they did. Um, you do have a choice at the end to see two different perspectives, kind of to choose who you're going to play at the end of the game, and I'm not going to reveal any more than that. But after you see both endings, you can go back and you can play it one more time, and you get an extra choice as the credits roll. So you have these companion characters known as pods, which are basically just little floating robots that like shoot th- shoot shoot out beams of light and or like have other power ups for you as you play. But they start to develop sentience as the game goes on, and they kind of ask you. At the end, they go. Essentially, they kind of say, "Hey, did you actually like this ending? Do you think that this is the way this should end, or do you think that we should do something else here?" And you're like, "I'm, I'm playing it. I'm like, wait, what?" And then it says, um, "Yeah, I like." Basically, they give you the choice: like, yes, no. And they, and then, of course, I'm like, um, "Yeah, I want to. I want to change this. Forget this. I, I I don't like the way this ended." And they're like, "Okay, are you sure you want to do this? It's going to be really difficult. We're going to have to find some way to uh, kind of fight against." you know, the, the design, the, 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 the developers in this game. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it anyway. So the credits roll again, the same credits that we just saw, only this time you're one of the little hacking, uh, like, shooters. Mm-hmm. It's like the bullet hell shooter. And it's the hardest bullet hell segment in the game. But you're basically, your enemies are the names of the developers. Oh, and so it's the like credits, a, oh, and you're, a credit sequence. <laughs> and so you're playing through it, and if you get through it at a certain point, and by the way, it's really hard. You have to like they have a few checkpoints, but it's really tough. And then at a certain point, it's like overwhelming enemies, and I, I keep dying. And it says, and it starts saying stuff like, like, um, are you sure you want to, you want to, you don't want to just quit here? This is you're probably not going to make it. And then like, like saying like a bunch of demoralized stuff. Like this is this is the way that it ended. You're just going to have to accept it. Just get over it. And I'm playing. And I'm like, no, screw it. I gotta beat this. This is this is nonsense. And so I keep going. I keep going. And then at, at, at one point, it, it, it says something like, um, "So do you agree that games are just silly little things? You don't need to worry about. Like, you, you don't. You shouldn't even care about them. Like, what do you care?" Kind of comments. And I'm like, "This is this is pretty. This is a pretty interesting questions. I think for for what they're asking because I like." W- it kind of made me sort of question, why do I care so much about what happens to these characters yeah. and what happens in this game? I do because the game is so effective at making you care. So I keep playing. At that point, when I answer that question, 
the very next part, it says, hey, would you like to accept help from your, your fellow gamers? Because you're probably not going to be able to beat this. And I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, so I click yes. And all of a sudden, I have, it's not just me as one little character. It's like, you know, 10 or 15 little ships all surrounding me all shooting at the same time as I'm shooting. And like oh, as they nice. die, other ones come in to help out. And so <laughs> now it's like, I can't lose. I'm going to win because I have the help from all these people <laughs> that, are, that, are, that are joining in. And we get to the end, because we all want to change this, the, the future of this game too. So at the end, you get a final cutscene that essentially reverses the ending again and kind of gives you more of a, an ending that you might want, like more of a, like, this is what I really wanted to happen kind of ending. Uh-huh. Very, it, in a sense of like, it's more like, he's kind of saying... No, you because that's the ending that the pods wanted to. And it almost makes it feel like the pods are actually, they represent more of the, of the players than any of the androids did. Because yeah. the pods, you, you, you make decisions through the pods. Uh, the pods are, the, are always observing the players. And you, you as playing, you're also kind of observing, observing them because it's always a third-person game of the different androids that you control. It's almost like a... Um, like a hidden fortress type situation, or you know, or Star Wars, where like they're the droids, and you're kind of you're seeing the adventures play out with the others, but you're you're more associated with the droids that are the observers. Um, so, what what I thought was really cool is that right after that sequence, it says um, after after you see everything and it, it plays through, and you get to see the little cutscene, it says, um, "Okay, you've won, but you know, other people might need help on this section too." Um, if you want, you could take all of your save data and just delete it. But if you do that, then with, when other gamers need help throughout the game, you'll be there to help them. Hmm. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. Because all throughout the game, there's these bodies that I saw littered around that were names of different players. And they would say little things that were kind of like weirdly inspirational. And you could like, you could basically suck up their energy. It's, and, it's like, a little bit like Dark bonuses, Souls, kind of. Like Dark Souls. Huh. But, but I, I was wondering, I thought it was just, if, if you die, your body just drops there. So apparently not. It's for that, it's for that ending sequence that I talked about and huh. for this choice. And if you choose to, to erase your save data and do this, and like at this point I was like, because I was kind of so caught up in everything that was going on and like all this, and being able to, to win that final section only because I had help from other players. Mm-hmm. So I said, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to delete my save data. And they keep, they keep they're warning you. They're like, are you sure? We're going to delete all of your save data if you do this. You know, the pods are talking to you. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And I do it. And it, and it goes through the menu, and it's erasing all of the chips that I gained, all of the experience level, all of the money. And it kind of gives you like a thank you message. Thank you for playing. And thank you for helping out your fellow gamers. The end. You go back to the main screen. The, the intro screen changes to something else now. All your data is gone. Any of your saves are gone. All you can do is play the game again. Hmm. Very like it, like it lets you change the ending of the game essentially, mm-hmm. and then it lets you erase all of your save data so you can help other players out in the game. You also get to choose your inspirational message, by the way. Oh, nice! You get to create your message from like little bits and pieces, kind of like a um, like you're picking different sections of like the yeah. of like the sentence that you're going to say to the yeah. to the gamers where they, when they find your body, hmm. or like in the last section. It's like little encouraging things, like um, uh, like. You know, oh, this this part was hard for me too. Hang in there, or stuff like that. It's like little, you know, whatever little statements. But it's pretty cool. I felt the game did really a, a fantastic job of making it feel like you're playing this together, you know, with other people, and it's like this this col- this collaborative experience almost. Hmm. Even though it's not, even though it's actually not, you're yeah. actually collaborating. But it makes you feel that way. Um, but I, I'm curious if y'all think, and we're kind of, I guess we can also be moving this into the gaming meta segment as well. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Kind of the way that games use cutscenes versus restrictive gameplay sections um, as, as, a, as a means of telling a story, and what's better and what's worse. And um, in a section like this, like for example, with kind of letting you, letting you change the ending and have the, have the ending that you want to have, based on your connection to these characters and sort of the sacrifice that you have to do to go through this, um, to me, made that section so much more important, that ending so much more important than if they had just said, okay, you beat the final boss, here's your ending. You know, it, it felt like I had to fight for it, and I wasn't even fighting against, like, the ending itself per se. I was almost fighting against the developers and the designers and, like, you know, they have this one thing where they're trying to tell this story, but I could technically have my own vision for how the game goes. 
Um, but when it comes to cutscenes versus restrictive gameplay elements, that was the, the one I mentioned, Doc, when I was talking about um, uh, the virus affecting you and you're kind of walking through and you're, you're losing control of your systems and um, it's a very frustrating experience for you as the player, but it's also frustrating for um, the character that you're portraying as well. So you're feeling that frustration as opposed to a cutscene that's showing you the frustration of a character. Because we're in an interactive medium, to me, that is something that's a lot more affecting. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, do you all have any comments on that in terms of just generally... Yeah, well, there have been a lot of games, I think, that have used that technique to great effect. Um, there's a segment kind of like that in um, in uh, Axiom Verge, um, that part where like you lose a bunch of your powers and you have to kind of like sneak past things right. and then regain right. your power. Um, Final Fantasy XV, we talked a little bit about uh, when Ignis gets blinded and you have to kind of like bring him along before he kind of um, gains his abilities back a little bit. Um, so you kind of like feel that frustration. And, and they do that in, uh, in Super Met... Uh, not Super Metroid. Um, I think it's, I want to say Zero Mission. One of the Metroid, I think it's Zero Mission. Not Zero Mission, um, Fusion. It's one of the Metroid games mm. where um, they take away your suit and you're like that, Zero Suit Samus. That, that was Zero Mission, yeah. And so it, yeah. Was, it was a remake of Metroid 1, but then they added this segment at the end of, like, so when the, when the original game ends, there's an additional portion where you have to sneak around for a little bit and then you get your suit back. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, like, kind of souped up when you do. Right, right. Um, and it kind of adds more to Samus' origin story and stuff like that mm-hmm. in a cool way. Uh, I mean, I think is, are there sections where, because I think the reason that this, this, go, this, this is kind of my theory, I think the reason that this is being used... Um, in part is so that you can experience the same sort of, or the hope is that you can experience the same sort of feelings that the character that you're portraying would be experiencing. Mm-hmm. Is why is, is why I think that they try to do this. I mean, but uh, but gamers also have have had negative reactions to these. Like mm-hmm. this exact segment segment that I'm talking about in the in uh, in near, there was a lot of negative feedback where people were very frustrated with this segment. Mm-hmm. Of course, that was the point was to be frustrated, but it kind of goes into that. The question of like our games art and what is art and this concept of okay if something is art like if a movie is art or a book is art or, or like you know a painting or games that doesn't mean this is this is cool and awesome and I love it every second right, mm-hmm. right. no that means sometimes sometimes you don't like it sometimes you have a negative reaction but that negative reaction might be the point mm-hmm. yeah if something's going to be art you have to take the good and the bad and you have to think about you know the the feeling I'm not saying something sucks, therefore it's good. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that frustration is, that could be the purpose. Like mm-hmm. you, The purpose could be they want you to be frustrated. And that's what I think. I think the purpose is they want you to be frustrated. They want you to feel, or in some games when they take your powers away, like with, with uh, Zero Suit. Mm-hmm. And uh, other games have done this too. Yeah. This concept of like depowering you or making you feel powerless as a player, mm-hmm. they do that on purpose because they're trying to make you feel what it's like to be this character. You can't really get that experience through a cutscene that just says... Oh, I have no power now. Oh, mm-hmm. this is this is horrible. Woe is me. As a as a player, when I see a cutscene like that, my first thought is, well, screw this. Give me back my big suit, and I'll. I don't care about your problem because mm. it's not my problem. Incidentally, there's kind of a little segment like that in um, Batman's Telltale mm. or Telltale's Batman, like we talked about last week uh, that I didn't I didn't touch on. But there's a portion where you kind of lose a little bit of control over your character. You try to say something, and you're kind of forced into saying something else. Um, and you, it's kind of a double-edged sword because if it's done well, it can be really impactful and really interesting. Right. right. And in other cases, it can be just like people feel cheated or whatever the case might be. Like you know, JRPGs, it's fair. It's a fairly frequent thing to sort of like throw you into the battle that you can't win. And so you know, some people will burn a whole bunch of items on that battle, thinking it's like, oh, I, I might have a shot to beat this. Is just really hard, and then you're really not meant to win it. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you have you have to like make it fairly clear that it's you've been depowered before you started or that it's like it, it's over quickly enough that people realize that you were never meant to win it, that sort of thing. Yeah, the, one of the more powerful moments in from from a JRPG when they do this, and not the I don't, I don't like the losing the battle part, like you mm-hmm. have to lose, um, but they have done that concept. Like way back in Final Fantasy three or Final Fantasy six for the Super Nintendo, um, there's this scene where the, the game's kind of broken into two parts: mm-hmm. the world of balance and the world of darkness. And the world of darkness is after the essentially an apocalyptic event, and now you have to gather all your team back. Everyone gets separated. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like I remember depressed that. and horrible, and they feel bad. Have you played? You played Final Fantasy? Yeah, I played six. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. So then you remember the scene where um, you wake up as as uh, Celis or Saris, depending mm-hmm. on which translation you're playing, and um, she's on a small island. She's she's been t- she's been you know asleep for a long time in a coma or something, and she's woken up by this one you know kindly old man who saved her and has been kind of nursing right. her back to health, and 
you can't really do anything except kind of, you know, go about your day. And then he gets sick, essentially is what happened, just to skip ahead a little bit. He gets sick, and now he's in trouble. And he needs, like, you got to find, like, a fish or, like, some water to kind of, like, help nurse him back to health. Mm -hmm. And... I remember it is potatoes, but that's probably wrong. Yeah, I, and well, you're on an island, so I just assume I think it was a fish, but it's something that you're trying to bring him something yeah. to kind of help him to try to help him get better. And so you go out and you find him, find him a fish, and you bring it back, you give it to him, and he dies anyway. And it's this, it's this depressing moment where you feel like one, you can't do anything because the whole game is just about you know you battling monsters essentially and leveling up and stuff right. like that. That doesn't help you here at all. No. And from the character's perspective. You know, she's lost all of her friends, all the people that she knows. Yeah. This is the one person left in her life, and now he dies, it's too. It's a complete futility, which is exactly what mirrors what has happened in the entire world. Exactly. Because the entire world has gone basically apocalyptic. And they way. want you to feel that, too. Yeah. And you do. You feel you feel terrible about it. So then when you get to the point where they have the scene where Ceres goes up to the roof and she jumps off, it's seemingly like she might be trying to kill herself. <laughs> right. It's a very It's a powerful moment, but if they had just done that in a cutscene, you wouldn't have felt that same emotion. Yeah, you wouldn't have expended the time and energy required to get to that point. Right. Felt the aggravation. Right. Yeah. And so that then when you, when she feels empowered to, you know, go out and reunite with her friends and, you know, this becomes like she takes from that negative moment, you know, an empowering moment, you feel that same thing. You're you're able to accept that. So mm-hmm. it's cuz it's not just stuck into like a like a cinematic cut, like a cut scene that it boils all those emotions down into like little little kitschy sound bites or little um, motivational moments. It becomes a real experience that you kind of shared with, with a character. And so that's why I think these, these moments are a lot more important for games. Um, to, be, to be honest, I would like to be to the point where we don't have cutscenes at all. Like, that's kind of my... You're mad, man. I, I know that... And I play games that have cutscenes, and I like games that have cut, I mean, I, I like Metal Gear Solid, so clearly I, yeah. I play... But I think that that's where games need to be headed, is away from the you can't control it because we're gonna like if they want to have a, a moment where you can't control the character in the game i'm not saying don't do that mm-hmm. do that but make it for a reason for an actual reason where you're taking away control from the player for a reason that makes sense within the game and you're trying to teach the player something mm-hmm. or or convey a lesson not because you're trying to just say i don't trust the player to do this thing in a cool way or i don't trust the player to do to have this reaction to this moment so instead i'm going to force them to do it because that's the way that I, I want my story to go. Mm. And even Metal Gear Solid's been known for some really great um, interactive portions, oh, too. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the MGS3, the swamp scene comes to mind where you have to wade through the swamp and the ghosts of the, all the soldiers you killed come mm-hmm. up. Um, Metal Gear Solid 4, there's the big microwave scene near the end where you have to, like, it's basically a quick time event, mm-hmm. but you have to keep mashing square to make him, like, crawl through this very long, very painful mm-hmm. thing. Well, well, what about the very first Metal Gear Solid with uh, Psycho Mantis? Mm-hmm. Where the battle with Psycho Mantis, he... Um, you have to switch controllers. You have to switch and, controllers. Yeah. He takes over your controller oh, and you I, can't beat him. I heard about that. You yeah. have to switch controllers. And so and, and it's supposed to be he's this guy who can read your mind and do this meta. So it makes sense. So you kind of feel that same frustration mm-hmm. that Snake does. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I'm actually reminded of a little feature that was on uh, the Escapist magazine, their mm-hmm. online website. Um, it was called Unskippable. Mm-hmm. And they, for about three years or so, they released every every week. I remember it was on Mondays because this is one of the few ones I hit yeah. regularly. And it's funny because last week we were talking about how when we played the Batman game, it was like Mystery Science Theater 3000. Right. That's exactly what they've done here. They've taken these, these frustrating, bad, unskippable cutscenes, and then they just they talk over them you know, in Mystery Science Theater 3000 style. And so what you've got is... Um, you know, these are clever guys. These are the guys behind loading, uh, LoadingReadyRun.com, if you've ever heard of that one. Um, but their tagline says, Unskippable makes fun of bad game cinematics so you don't have to. And I think that that's a very important thing to what you're talking about here. That frustration that you're talking about, getting across the idea of frustration, um, if we're actually playing out the frustration through game mechanics, we experience the frustration in a good way. Versus if we're forced to watch some kind of mind-numbing cutscene that we can't skip, that's forcing us to have frustration. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? There's a different kind of frustration. Both of them are frustration. But one is frustration because you have no control. And another is frustration because you feel like you should have control. Um, Or you you do have control is probably a better way to say it. 
You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so I think that there's more emotions. There's a broader range than just control. But I think that that's a really good way to put a pin on it, you know, kind of narrow it down and go, what is the fundamental difference between forcing the player to have this experience versus allowing the player to have this experience? Mm-hmm. And to me, that's what it really comes down to. Um, yeah, you know, restrictive gameplay elements. Whenever whenever I played through Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, I thought early on there was a really brilliant moment. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, but a really brilliant moment where you kind of had to win the race. And they could have shown you a cutscene where you won the race, but they didn't. They allowed you to run, you know, to actually run the race, but they did it in such a way that Aloy was clever enough. She ran an old path, and what happens then is, no matter what time you yourself, as the player, get there, the other uh, contestants will get there just after you, and you will win, win the race. So, a little more explanation on exactly what that scene was. But mm-hmm. regardless, I thought it was extremely clever. Uh, up until the point I realized that the actual results of that race don't matter within the context of the narrative of that game. So the problem that I have um, with making a blanket statement like there shouldn't be any cutscenes at all... Yeah, I, oh, I'm backing I, away from that a little bit. I don't know. Just because I think there's, there's, there's... Sometimes you sort of need them for certain things that... Because you may not be... Like, your game may not have those mechanics to get across whatever you're trying to show. Yeah. So, but they should be a lot more sparing than what we, what we have. Yeah. So I think if... It should just be, for example, um, like, like in Nier that we're talking about, um, where you're descending to the planet in, in your um, ships. Mm-hmm. And you're, like, you're like going into... Um, uh, what is it? Like, the, the re-entry zone or whatever yeah, in, yeah. in the atmosphere. You can't really show that. They didn't create that environment. You know, because why would you? You never actually play in that space. Okay. So... They just show that in like a shortcut scene where they're coming through, so that you can, so they can explain why. Um, it's just a couple seconds the mech long, gets though, destroyed, right? and it's only a couple seconds okay. long. So yeah, if you're doing like like short short moments or something that you're trying to convey information, mm-hmm. um, it it just I think all of it goes back to um, exposition and kind of the, the an old story um, directive where you're you really should show don't tell. Right. Well, I think with games, it's you should play not show. I agree. For the, for the most, if you can. So that doesn't mean that you can never show. Mm-hmm. Just like how with, with in, there is still exposition needed sometimes in novels. You, don't, you can't always show but not tell. Sometimes mm-hmm. you do have to tell. But the rule is that if you can show, you show instead of tell. Right. And in this case in games, I think it's if you can play it, if, the, if your game supports those mechanics, then they should be able to play it as mm-hmm. opposed to watch it happen. Did you get that from Jesse Schell? That's a Jesse Shellism. Really? Yeah, it is. Oh, no, I just made it that sure up. Oh. Mm-hmm. oh, okay. Cool. I guess we're on the same page. Yeah, there you go. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward compatible.com. All right, so today we have a letter from the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick Kruger, our uh, musician who writes all the music for all of our intros and mm-hmm. stuff. He's been on the show a few times. Yeah, uh, has been a guest, super talented guy. Hey, Nick. Uh, he writes, Here's a thought I had comparing the art of video games with the art of stand-up comedy. It's often said that dissecting a joke makes it unfunny. If you have to explain a joke, you've completely ruined the point. Let's use a comedian as an analog for a game designer. When a comedian is writing a joke, he might find it funny at first, but as he practices his set, refines his material, and finds new, funnier ways of delivering his jokes, there's a good chance that he doesn't find the jokes funny anymore. Another side point is one that I'll compare to music. I heard a term once that gets applied a lot to music written in the academic space correct music which of course i mean is the most in the most derisive way possible is music that is so perfect in its use of structure harmony counterpoint etc that all drama or texture is completely drained from it and it completely forgets what makes music interesting in the first place Interesting music is that which breaks the rules and doesn't focus on the composer's ability to create something that on paper is very well crafted but isn't exciting to listen to. So then, 
My question to you is, do you think that these are good analogies for games and game design? A game designer might get to the point where their game isn't fun to them anymore because of how much work they've put into perfecting the mechanics, debugging, etc. If they play another person's game, they're constantly thinking about the mechanics from a game designer's perspective, not the layperson gamer's perspective. Does that enrich their experience with the game or harm it? Is it better to play a game and experience it for what it is or to dissect it and understand it in the context of other games? Mm. I, I honestly, I think he is making two different points here, though. Like mm. two, both, both interesting points, but two different points. Um, the first point being that this concept of correct music, which I really like, mm-hmm. I really like that concept. Um, it's been explored in some in some other medium. Like the first thing I can think of is um, data in the next generation had well, to sure. had to ad- address this because as an Android, he could um, technically play the music right, but it never it didn't quite have that. You know, it was missing the soul. It was mm-hmm. kind of this concept they played with, where you know he was following all the rules perfectly. Why wasn't it perfect? Because it, that's like uh, like Nick was saying, it's like the interesting part are sort of the, the extra flourishes and the, 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 the addition of texture and putting yourself into that That's performance. That's what jazz is all about. Right, putting yourself into the performance as well, not just performing it exactly. And so I think in that concept, I think that goes to games when it comes to, and I, I totally agree with that, by the way. I think there's this concept of a correct game, you know, mm-hmm. or a perfect game, or like, I'm going to make this um, action game and it's going to have it's going to have this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature because we know all these features are what we need for the game and it's going to be done in this way and it's going to be done in this way and it's going to have this sort of an, of a structure to the game and mm-hmm. players are going to learn about it learn learn the mechanics of the game in this way and it's when you do that you're you're stripping out any of the potential personality mm-hmm. that you could put to the game right this is reminding me of what i one of my biggest criticisms with transistor yeah is i mentioned how my impression that i came away with was that they had this checklist of things that we're going to do these things in these ways because we've we've read all the reviews we've heard all the critics we've heard all the discussions and like we know that like the way not to do blank is to do it this way for example mm. but they sort of like went through and did all those things properly and the game I didn't think was that much better for it. It wasn't a bad game. I'm not saying that Transistor was a was a poor um, effort. It's just that it kind of had this feeling of sterileness to me. Yeah, that it, like it, yeah. It, it did everything quote unquote right, and yet it didn't feel better for it. it, it you have to be greater than the sum of your parts. You were distanced right? from the mm-hmm. yeah, from you the have heart be, and soul of the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So you have to be greater than the sum of your parts. You can have all the right parts, but there has to be that cohesion there that makes it a better product overall. And 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 some of that is going to be. What are the elements that stand out about this game? Yes. What are the creative elements? What's the like extra touch? Like, why does it matter if it can just be done in, in, via checklist and everything be checked off? You know, it, isn't that something that could be eventually just automated with uh, with AI or uh-huh. machine? Sure. So we need that creative element, that that personalized element, the soul of the yeah. game, the soul of the designer, or really designers, because as we know, lots of people work on the games and lots of them put in their own touches, whether it's the character artist, the sure. animator. Or the writer, or the the you know level designer, um, whatever the case may be, the programmer, mm-hmm. etc. You know, about a decade or so ago, um, I was teaching high school, and I took my high school class down to the symphony hall, and it so happened that what was going on was Anthony Daniels had come into town and was reading the plot of Star Wars. Wow! <laughs> while in the background, in the key scenes, if you will, the symphony was playing the classic music from, from the, so really what his his little intercuts were was to get us to the next song because that's what it was really about it was about the the music but whenever you have no visuals and all you have is just the instruments and just the music and just that you really focus on it and, and you can hear vader and you can hear luke and you can hear leia and it's all this stuff and it's like that but there's no visuals how am i getting this and and and, and you get sort of the heart of that symphony's version of this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was like a whole completely different, unique experience of the Star Wars experience that, frankly, you know, not many people had. That's kind of where I come with it, is that if I can come away from a video game with my own unique experience um, out of it, then it's a really well-designed game. If you and I fundamentally had the same exact experience in that game, that's a different kind of game, and there might even be a problem. Mm-hmm. That said, um, I don't think that it disqualifies 
game designers from from making games. I think mm-hmm. it's the other way around. I think honestly, if you're going to be an artist, you have to be familiar with the master. Right. If right. you're going to make games, you need to play games. In fact, I think probably, especially in the academic world, something I know a little bit about, there are a lot of game design professors out there who don't play nearly enough games. Mm-hmm. They they know the theory, but they have not spent the uh, 15 to 20 hours a week that's Fra- frankly, required in order to to keep up, and, and also playing the the foundational games too. I think is very important. Oh, yes. that that some students as well wouldn't necessarily do. Yeah. Like I know when I was when I was um, you know teaching teaching some courses, and I would mention games that aren't. I didn't even consider that old, but like I, I oh, was yeah. talking about Metroid Prime, and I was just shocked with people that are in a in a in a game design or an intro to game design course not that had not what played courses. Yeah. Metroid Prime. That's right. And so this is one of those one of those foundational games that was an influential game. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's many of them there that hadn't even played, say, Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. You know, little games that if you're planning, if you, you want to get into games, you have to understand them. It doesn't mean that games haven't evolved in a lot of ways since then. Oh, of course. But there's elements that are taken from these earlier games. And it's like the same thing if you're trying to, to be a, um, a filmmaker. Yes. You still want to go back, you want to analyze movies, and you want to go back and, and watch these these older films that... Many times. Yeah, that many times, and see, okay, what did they do, and how did they do it, and what was their reason behind it? And so if you right. you have to approach it that way if you really want to be, mm-hmm. um, you know, an expert in your field. Yeah. And, and I do think, so that's, so when he says, well, you might be losing something in terms of, oh, you're just too close to it, you're too, being too critical, mm-hmm. you may not be able to have find the same joy. I disagree. I think it's the opposite. I think because yeah. you, you're so aware of all these different ways and like the, the background of it, because I'm someone that I do that with games, but I also do it with movies. I watch mm-hmm. a lot of movies. Yes. And I, I'm extremely critical of movies and I've gotten, um, and I, as, as I am of games, I mean, I'm just a critical person in general, I guess, but because mm-hmm. I'm so knowledgeable in those areas, you know, I have had some people criticize me right, sure, <laughs> and yeah. to come back and say, well, what, you don't even enjoy this. Why do we even go out and watch a movie with you? Or why do we even talk about games with you if you, if you seem so critical sometimes about, about them? And, but I like that. I, like, I, like, I think that by being critical, by identifying what was right and what was wrong, yes. it helps you understand um, the game better. Yeah. And also, you know, just because you, you critique something and you may not have f- found it the best, um, the most fun aspect, like, for example, that moment that I explained in Nier, was a frustrating moment for me when mm-hmm. you're walking and you don't have it was very frustrating. I was I was like throw the controller angry. <laughs> I had to redo that part three times. Very frustrated with that whole part. And yet that was the point of that. Like that was the, p- the point yeah. was to get you that frustrated. It's gonna so become I didn't, seminal for you, yes, I think. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it, but yet it was it's something that I'm not gonna forget. There, there's there's a part lot of the experience that, that, like, in hindsight, that part of the experience, that was part of the experience that the experience as a whole was better for. Yes. And yeah. you enjoyed the entire experience because you experienced that part of frustration. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, kind of briefly to, to mention, you know, a little bit more on, like, the comedian kind of, like, overanalyzing their stuff. I mean, yeah, I can definitely see the, the thing that can happen where if you've been working on something for a long time, I, I think it applies a lot to uh, writers. Once you've been writing something and revising and stuff like that, you, you almost start to, like, lose the heart of the story. Yeah. And there's a thing that happens as a as a creator in that sense where you have to kind of at some point have faith in the vision you had when you first started you know because at some point it is going to become kind of like sterile and it's just going to be like a thing that you're working on Mm -hmm. to you but at the same time there's you know people who are going to read it are going to start to like you know experience the same things that got you excited about in the first place yeah if you do it right if Mm -hmm. you do it right so it's it's something that like you know you definitely need to put in that thought and that effort and that detail into honing your craft and honing the product um, but, you know, kind of taking too far can be, like, a really big issue. So um, That's a really good point, yeah. So, yeah, it's 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 really tough balance to strike for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, like, you know, kind of the darker side of that is if you, again, sort of coming back to the perfect music, if you overanalyze to the point where all you're doing is creating something that's, like, very technically right, mm-hmm. you might be focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So. Well, one final example, which I think is going to work on two levels here, Whenever I played Shadow of the Colossus, Mm -hmm. one of the things that really stuck out to me was the music. Because you have this long stretch of nothing. Mm -hmm. No enemies to fight, no music, no anything. You've got kind of like nature sounds, Mm -hmm. right? Actually, Breath of the Wild does this. Yeah, Breath of the Wild does this really really well, too. And then you get into this um, procedural music that starts to amp up and ramp up, and then it gets more energetic, and it sort of mirrors what it is you're doing and where you are on the beast. And if you fall off, it actually... 
comes back, sort of almost cascades back down with this mournful, soulful kind of, oh no, kind of a thing. And you have to start over and it, music builds back up again. And when you finally kill the thing, it's a crescendo. Mm. And then it falls. And then again, the, when the, I guess it's like the, the magic juice that comes out of the, the, the magic black smoke that, that, that powers all colossi comes into you. Again, it's, it's mournful, it's soulful. It's telling the story with the music mm-hmm. of what you're doing in that moment. And it's entirely procedural based upon whether you're being successful or not being successful in that moment. And so the way that, that it works on a technical level is that there's, there's three or four different tracks and it's just switching between the tracks and they all match up perfectly. So if you think in terms of abstractions, in terms of what do I want it to be like if a person is doing this? What do I want it to be like if a person is doing that? And, and you, you give all of that to the player, then the player can still um, experience it their way and still have the, the, the perfect magical soundtrack, if you will, to all of that. And I think that that, that goes across the levels. You know what I'm saying? I think it speaks mm-hmm. to, to Nick's metaphor, and I think it also speaks to... Um, the player's experience on a fundamental level. If you give the players, if you, if you trust the players, Jim, there it is again. <laughs> yeah. I said that a couple of weeks ago. If you trust the players to be able to do a thing and you give them the kind of feedback you would expect while they're doing that thing, the player becomes the composer. The player becomes the artist. The player becomes the interactor. That's important. And that's, I think, what we lose when we get too crunchy with our game design. Mm-hmm. And maybe we need to step away, play some other games, and then come back to it. Yeah. In a perfect world. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. Thanks for writing in, Nick. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the concept of um, Kisho Tenketsu. Uh, um, can, I, can I try to say that too? Sure. Kishoten, wait. Kishoten Katsu. Wait, Kishoten Katsu. <laughs> Kishoten Kat. Yeah. I want to name my cat that. <laughs> Kisho, Kishoten Kat. Did I do it? So, yeah, and I, I apologize really to, this. to anyone really who actually this. knows how to pronounce Japanese. I'm um, trying, man. Because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, it, so it's spelled like the way you'd read it, or at least the way that I read it, is Kishoten Katsu. Um, but I, a lot of times in Japanese, when you have the S-U at the end, the U is kind of like semi-silent, so it almost comes across more like Kishoten Katsu. Um, kind of like desu, you know, it's not pronounced desu most of the time, it's just pronounced des. So, anyway. Um, but what it is, it's a four-act uh, dramatic story structure. Um, and originally came from Chinese poetry and kind of became a, a, a adapted into, like, you know, four-panel comics and into just, like, you know, novels and stuff like that. And it, it's a little bit um, distinct from, you know, what we kind of think of in Western culture as what a typical story structure is. Um, so everyone is probably familiar with the uh, Freytag Triangle, or Freytag Triangle. And that, of course, is, you know, kind of you start with the introduction or the, uh, the exposition. You have the inciting incident that introduces the main conflict of the story. You have rising action, you reach a climax, and you have the falling action, the denouement. Um, I've taught you well. My job here is done. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, much better pronunciation, by the way, on, the, on denouement. Than, denouement. Thank you. Than the, the cashew kits to... No hablo. <laughs> he showed <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, what, what this other structure does is it starts off with um, he is the introduction. You have show is the development. Um, then you have ten, which is the twist. And you have kets, which is the conclusion. Now, um, just generally speaking, and I think that this is a big reason for it, you know, you can kind of look at Western and Eastern um, storytelling and kind of find they have a very different feel. Um, this is something that we studied back when I was taking mythology in um, grad school. Um, how, like, you know, Eastern and, like, Native American mythologies tend to have more of a cyclical nature. They're a little bit more about, like, you know, kind of humans' interaction with nature and our place in it, whereas Western mythology and culture tends to focus more on kind of overcoming trials and challenges, kind of the almost the conquering mentality, if you want to put it that way, of we have come across this new land, there's this challenge that we need to overcome, to conquer, and then to, you know, thrive, and then repeat. And, and that's kind of... With with that in particular, I mean that's it's kind of developed in in Western culture as well mm-hmm. because you know going back to like say Greek Greek plays mm-hmm. and the way that they that they were structured. That's right. Um, instead of having this, you know, we think of the Freytag Freytag's triangle the way that our modern Western stories work. Mm-hmm. It's more of a a right triangle. 
yeah, almost a right triangle. Well, it's supposed to be. Where, where you get to your climax, and then the falling action and the denouement, these are short sections after the climax. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But back in the, it, with, with Greek plays, it was much more of an equilateral triangle yes. where you, know, you, you, you hit that, you do the rising action, you hit the climax, and then there's still half the, half the play left. And yeah. that, that falling action is, is pretty much taking the same, a similar length of time as the rising action, which for, for, for a modern Western audience, that would also be very different sort mm-hmm. of as structurally. Yeah. Of yeah. course, you're also talking about the three-act play, which the is three act the play, correct. traditional I'm, uh, Greek yes. three-act play, yes. um, ending in, in a catastrophe and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, even like you talk about in, in the, oh, the, the 20th century, we have like uh, Tolkien. Mm-hmm. Who's like was so mm, dissatisfied with the catastrophe that he decided that he would create the bad ending that ends well, uh, mm-hmm. so that everything goes wrong, but it's still okay. Like when um, Gollum bites off spoilers, mm-hmm. Gollum bites off Frodo's finger and, oh, and then man. falls in, and all. I know. I was right? reading through that. Oh, yeah. uh, they made a movie. Just so we we should have warned you to leave the room. For right. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know that that's the U catastrophe because uh, in in the book they get home. And uh, Hobbiton's been taken over. Um, in fact, most people don't realize that that in the original book, uh, Saruman, not Sauron, but Saruman, actually dies on the doorstep of um, Bag End. It's, it's mm-hmm. really interesting the way that that all works. And so what you've got is this long tail of the downward, mm-hmm. you know, falling action, or denouement, yeah. if you prefer, mm-hmm. um, where it all wraps up. So... Yeah, I think that a lot of what we're talking about here is the difference between the the Western sort of American attention span. We won't tolerate more than five or six minutes of closing action now. Mm-hmm. We just simply won't. And that's why the extended edition of Lord of the Rings puts a lot of people to sleep. Mm-hmm. I watch it every year, uh, all 12 hours, every New Year's Day, mm-hmm. um, and, and just love it. I love the fact that the last hour is falling action. Right. Because it really, it really gives you time to sort of like – have a sense of closure. Yeah, right. Um, exactly so, right. so many times, like, you know, endings that feel a little bit dissatisfying to me, especially in, like, say, you know, long games, RPGs is an example. Sometimes it feels like the game ends too quickly and then I just feel a little bit dissatisfied. I, I like it when the game takes its time. And really, I think sometimes, even if the game was a very long story getting up to the climax and finishing, mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like the story was long unless you have a long time to sort of let it settle down and conclude. That's true. Um, but anyway, just a little bit of background on why I wanted to talk about this is we had um, this fun little thing we did, uh, March Madness, at our office. Instead of doing the, the basketball brackets, we had a movie bracket. And the idea was that over the course of a couple of weeks, we were going to be voting on what movie we might want to watch in the office. And um, long story short, Spirited Away, uh, the Miyazaki film, actually ended up uh, being the movie that we watched at our office. Interesting. Um, which I was very excited about. I was actually one of the people who was kind of uh, campaigning for the film because I studied Miyazaki in college. And it's like, oh, man, this would be like a really cool thing to like let everyone experience. Yeah, I, did, I did too. It's, it's, also, a, it's a great movie. It's also a good general audience movie. film. Like, you know, some of the other movies on there were like Inglorious Bastards, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which, I mean, would have been fun to watch, but I'm not sure if it like, you know, might have been yeah. a little bit much for some people. Spirited Away is one of those movies that you could you could take like your child to go see it. Mm-hmm. They would enjoy it, and then you, as an adult, would enjoy it on a different level. Mm-hmm. So that's which makes it good for this sort of general audience. Because like mm-hmm. in *Glorious Bastards*, you can't really not even just kids, but like some people are just not going to like that movie because of mm-hmm. you know the way they present some of the gruesome violence and, mm-hmm. and the cursing and, and the historical have. inaccuracies. And of course, the historical oh, inaccuracies. Oh, those right. historical inaccuracies. Mm-hmm. And so I figured Matt that the, Damon wasn't actually back there in that time period. Yeah, he totally was actually. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> He's yeah. a lich. Never mind. Um, and so I, uh, I was thinking like this would be like a really great like sort of all audiences experience for everyone. And so um, I was interested to see everyone would react. It was actually a, bit, a little bit of a mixed reaction, really, um, where there were some people who kind of like came out of it liking it, and then there were some who were kind of like I don't get it, or kind of like you know sort of. In, in the way that a lot of Japanese films do. I don't films get do. it. <laughs> not, don't not, get this, not even this like one. that so much. It's just like... So, so there were ghosts in there? Why did ghosts need to take a bath? No, I don't understand. I, I work with a lot of very intelligent people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think I might be one of those I don't get I'm, it, Jim. I'm trying to get... I haven't seen the film, but... I'm trying to get hate mail. I don't know if you've noticed this. These past few episodes, I'm send really trying my hardest. inbox at <laughs> dashcompatible.com. Do, do actually, save us a little bit of uh, uh, headache and just send it to Jim at backwarddashcompatible.com. Yeah, there you go. That's no. it. <laughs> we don't actually have a... Is that, uh, is that a real email? We don't. No. Oh, just we don't. send it to email in, inbox, but just put as your title, just gem hate mail. <laughs> nice. And then what we'll do is if I if we get some if I get some hate mail, just the Jim next episode, I will read the hate mail 
<laughs> myself hate mail about me, I will read it off on the next show. We could create a whole segment about Jim. We could make a whole segment <laughs> we, about we hate mail. We could mail. call it Jim Bag. Sure, <laughs> sure. I like it. I like it. Yeah. But you have to actually send in the hate mail. That's a thinker. You have to think about that one. Which, I, I, I it may it. not happen. I, I'm, I'm just not hateable, I think, is what is the problem. I'm yeah. just, I'm too lovable. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think for the people who felt... Uh, <laughs> Chris is like, I'm cutting, on, I'm cutting all that. Got <laughs> nothing. We're cutting that. Moving on. Um, I think what what people were kind of experiencing when they weren't like really not getting it, it wasn't like really like hitting them, you know, the way that might some be, might some people, is um, just how different these storytelling structures are. I think that Spirited Away, while you can identify the conflicts in it, it's mm -hmm. not a conflict-driven plot. No, no, it's not. And I think that that's kind of the main difference it, is whether or not the plot is driven by the conflict. It, it's it's like this. The con there there is a it, there is an inciting incident mm -hmm. in in the beginning of Spirited Away. I mentioned, um, I guess before we started recording, where her her family are essentially turned into pigs. Mm -hmm. and they're going to be essentially fed to someone eventually if mm -hmm. she doesn't rescue them. So there is that, and yet the film is presented without so really that sense of urgency. It's mm -hmm. more of a. Um, this is a slice of life almost yeah. film mm -hmm. in this fanciful environment. Yeah. And what it, also slice what it ultimately life. is is a coming of age story. Yes, that, that's the, yes. that's sort of like the core thing about it. And I think if you look at say the hero's journey, which this is a little bit cheating because Campbell actually was trying to make something that was universal to yeah, all cultures. Um, but you know, you can sort of line it up with the hero's journey and kind of like have the ability to compare it to Western narratives in that way. Um, but so to kind of break down a little bit um, how um, Keisha Tenketsu works. Um, broadly speaking, is it tends to come across a little bit more experiential, I would call it. So I found this um, this post on Tumblr from a blog called Still Eating Oranges. Um, they editorialize a little bit. I think there's like maybe a little bit of a bias um, in a few of what they're a few of the things that they say, but I think it still does a good job of summarizing uh, for some people how this works. And so they have like they had the artist for the blog draw a couple little four panel comics to compare a plot that might help to explain this a little bit. So. If we're going with a Kisho Tenkets plot, um, we see in the first panel there's a girl who's at a soda pop machine, um, and she presses the button, and you hear a kathunk as the can hits the bottom. Second panel, she grabs the soda pop. Um, third panel, we cut to something completely different. It's some boy sitting on a table. And then the fourth panel, the girl walks up and hands him the can of soda, says here, and he says, he says oh. So... If you only take the first three panels, it almost seems kind of random. You've got someone at the soda machine and then kind of like a, a, a sensible follow-up action. The third panel, though, just cuts to something that's totally unrelated. You don't know why we have this juxtaposition until you get to the fourth one, which kind of brings it all together and provides a new context for the whole thing. So are you – so here's the way I'm understanding mm -hmm. Kishu Ketsu. Kishu Tenketsu. Thank you. Uh, Tonkatsu, I can say that. <laughs> um, so here's the way I'm understanding it. It's kind of like – um, Monty Python's Flying Circus, where the sketch is going along just fine. Then, then they go, okay, and now for something completely different. <laughs> and suddenly it's attached to a completely different element. And then they'll just somehow mix in that previous part mm -hmm. with that sketch. Like mm -hmm. they, they do so that they're two all different the time. sketches. So yeah. it's two different sketches, and yet they'll mix. They'll almost like mix them together mm -hmm. at the end. That's a really great comparison. Yeah, actually, it really is. That's, <laughs> but isn't that that kind of? And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. really even joking mm -hmm. here. I think no, it kind of no. does. Yeah. Yeah. make sense. There's so many callbacks within episodes, and even amongst episodes of of Monty Python. You know, it was mm -hmm. just, I'm imagining just. The larch, yeah. the larch, <laughs> and then, then they just move on. It's like what? Um, actually, it, it, it reminds me of like you know a classical Chinese poem that sort of inspired the structure. Um, I, I can't recite it exactly in different translations. Do it differently, but basically, it talks about. It, it sets up the scene of spring flowers, and you can hear the birds chirping and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It kind of gives you this mental image, and then the next panel is now the storm is crashing down. And then the final point that they make is the image of, um, you know, petals being washed away and stuff like that. And he's wondering how many of the, the beautiful flowers survived this storm. So the storm kind of comes in and turns the whole thing on its head. That's the twist. Mm -hmm. The twist totally recontextualizes and everything. To be, to be honest, to relate this to what we talked about earlier with, with the story in Nier, mm -hmm. that's what happens in Route C. Mm -hmm. It recontextualizes the whole story that you played through in the first two routes and turns everything on its head and mm -hmm. gives you this great twist. And now... Things kind of go in this different direction, yet there's this relationship with the first part that's mm -hmm. kind of also added back in later on. Mm -hmm. And so then, by the time you get to the end, you're looking at the entire piece exactly. And then, it, then yeah, and then it sort of that actually changes your perspective. Yeah, that that frames everything that you said mm -hmm. and and clears it all up for me, Jim. Mm -hmm. What it is that we're trying to do. Yeah. 
That's cool. And so in contrast, the same blog, and I don't know if this is necessarily the best example, but a counterpoint, it's kind of like if we're looking at a three-act structure, conflict-driven sort of plot, the four panels, you see the girl with the soda machine, she presses a button, uh, next panel, she's looking down because the soda hasn't come down, and she says, oh, nothing. So the next one is sort of like banging on the machine a little bit, and then the soda pop, you know, thunks down, and she grabs it in the last panel. So it's very much a conflict-centric um, idea where she's trying to get a soda, it's not working, she does something to cause the soda to come down, and then she gets what she was going for. Yeah. Um, it's all about getting the soda, not about this, you know, sort of thing of why is she getting the soda to give it to this person? Do, do we think that this is actually... Because I, I like that relationship mm-hmm. with, with the Monty Python sketches, and I'm almost feeling like there's a relationship here with comedy, only Japanese present... Th- the Japanese story structure and I guess Chinese story structure as well um, takes it in a more dramatic way. But like, a, like this is common. A common theme in comedy is you present an issue and then then you recontextualize it in a way that is funny. Yeah, you know, the like unexpected, the unexpected, right? And 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 then it relates back to the beginning when you put it in context. You go, oh, and then then people laugh. Right, it's done for humor. But here, it's kind of a similar concept mm-hmm. that I'm hearing from from Japanese and Chinese story structure. But instead, they're doing it. Uh, dramatically for mm-hmm. drama as yes. opposed to comedy. Well, there's nothing more Western than Shakespeare, right? I right. mean, this this is Shakespeare. It's Elizabethan. It's mm-hmm. it's English. It's all this. But when you really look at his um, comedy structure, mm-hmm. the things that are especially his comedies, mm-hmm. but but all of his plays have comedic elements in them. Oh yeah. But but anything that is this funny in in Shakespeare comes comes into play with the double meaning. The unexpected double meaning, the double entendre, the, the that kind of thing. Look, that woman, uh, or rather, that man is uh, dressed up as a woman, and everyone thinks that uh, she, he's a woman, but really he's a man. But then, it's, like, he's falling in love with this person who's really a woman dressed as a man. I mean, it's, it's like all these mix-ups, and it's that it's it's an almost Eastern design that that we think is funny because it's so awkward. Mm-hmm. Makes me wonder if it goes both ways. Mm. Actually, if our Western structure is is seen as mm. humorous, <laughs> right? That's it's kind of it's kind of a good question. I know that to relate this back into into video games because mm-hmm. we've been talking about the story structure. Um, I know when you first proposed this topic, I did some some quick googling, looking mm-hmm. around, and I found um, that apparently. Nintendo has been structuring a lot of their stories this way. Yeah. And actually, um, I was, I was going to mention uh, Mark Brown, who we mm. mentioned on Reading List a couple weeks ago, um, did a video actually where talks about the level design of Super Mario. Yeah. Um, specifically, like, going back from Galaxy and now into, like, 3D Land and 3D World. Mm-hmm. Um, and he talks about how the level designer uh, or the level director um, actually very specifically is drawing inspiration from Kisho Tenkets, where he introduces, um, it kind of like on a level-to-level basis, and in a mechanical sense, more so than a narrative sense. So he actually um, introduces a new mechanic, um, and this is something that Mark explains very well in his video, you should go check it out. Um, he introduces a mechanic, a new, a new concept for the game, in kind of a safe environment at first, mm-hmm. um, where it's like you see how this works, but you really can't mess it up. And then you develop it a little bit further to see, like, you know, okay, so this is how it applies, and it's getting a little bit more difficult now. There's not a safety net anymore. Um, so you actually have to start applying what it is you've learned. That makes but sense. then partway through the level, they put it uh, put a twist on it, where now it's not just doing that. It's doing that and also having to evade attacks from this other enemy that you encountered mm-hmm, earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they kind of do both things, where they introduce that obstacle, then they introduce the enemy, and then they put them together. For example, and then the um, the conclusion, they kind of give you one last abil- or one last chance to sort of show off your skills and to you know mas- show show mastery of it in a way that kind of like in, in the Mario levels a lot of times it's just kind of like a bonus where if you do it right you can get the top of the flagpole yeah which right. gives you some bonuses but you know you don't have to do it that way you can totally just bypass it um, in a lot of cases um, so they kind of develop this mechanic over the course of the sort of like four parts of the stage. Um, and then uh, they do it again with another mechanic in another level. Or sometimes once you've mastered one of those mechanics, then they'll sort of have that repeat in later levels and that sort of thing. But now you know what it is because you've been introduced in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's uh, like that's at least a mechanical application of this concept. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's neat. I'm trying mm-hmm. to think of the art. I think the article that I found might have been on Escapist, mm-hmm. and um, as I recall, they they actually had said that Miyamoto himself would. Sp- would actually do this for the early Mario games as well. Mm-hmm. Like he specifically would try to use similar concepts. Mm-hmm. So I imagine a lot of a lot of um, 
design decisions in that company are sort of influenced by him anyway, mm -hmm. even if he's not designing the game. But that's really interesting that they had um, one of the designers talk specifically about games like Super Mario Galaxy mm -hmm. um, and that concept as well. Mm -hmm. so. Um, and I think that, you know, when we start talking a little bit more about the narrative aspect, um, I think one of the reasons that, you know, it, sometimes these stories don't quite click for Western audiences, they feel a little bit weird, um, is because in those first couple of stages, the introduction and then the development, they can feel a little bit meandering. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes the twist feels like totally random, like, why, why are you, why are you even bringing this up? Because if you're not, if it doesn't look like a twist necessarily, say it's just like you're exploring a concept and you just introduce another concept, um, and then you tie them together at the end. Um, you know, you have to get the full thing before it kind of like clicks for you. Would you say Breath of the Wild does some of this? Like mm. specifically with the abilities that you gain along the way. Mm. You know, you, you learn to chop a tree down, and then you can apply the fact that you oh well, that if that tree falls into water, it will float, and then you can actually use that um, to to make a bridge for yourself to get out to a chest, and then. I would say, yes. Since that's one of the mm -hmm. ways you get out to the chest, the thing that's in the chest mm -hmm. is meaningful and builds upon the knowledge that you obviously had to get out there. Right. I think that in some cases they do. Um, it's not quite as guided as it is in these Mario levels. Because mm -hmm. in the Mario levels, they sense. can like very linearly sort of like guide you down this path, and you have to do these things in order to get to the end. That makes sense. Whereas with Breath of the Wild, a lot of the stuff is kind of optional. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I think the same sort of concepts apply. Um, I think and, it applies a little more to, like, the shrines, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, the, the fact that everything kind of comes together near the end, it makes me think a little bit of, as far as games are presented and their structures, that in some cases, like, not in every case, but in some cases it might actually be more useful to look at games in kind of a Kisho Tenketsu sense as opposed to a um, Freytag's Triangle sense. Where what we're kind of doing is, you know, we've talked a little bit before about the idea of episodic content. Yeah. Games. Um, I've heard him compare before to plays where, like, the fact that um, you're kind of, the story's changing a little bit each time it's played. Kind of makes it a little bit more like a stage mm -hmm. play than a movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think in this particular case, sometimes games are just a series of experiences. It reminds me a little bit, actually, of Spirited Away, of how there are lots of little plot threads that are going through it. But it never, none of it really feels like... Uh, here is the the central thing. There's always kind of like the general goal, the reason why she's doing what she's doing. But we have like a little side thread that opens up, you know, ABC story arcs in a sense mm -hmm. that kind of get resolved in their own way. And all together, this experience kind of becomes like it, it kind of takes on this new meaning because of all these different experiences that happened along right. the way. Yeah, well, when you get to the end, everything clicks together, yeah. like, like exactly yeah. like Chris is talking about. But sometimes it it can feel like well, wait a minute, we, we were just exploring this plot point. Why are all of a sudden we doing this thing mm -hmm. now? So it does feel like it can jump around at parts, but you have to be prepared for that ride and go along with it. Mm -hmm. And when you do, I think it's a very satisfying experience. But um, something that I find interesting, too, on this is that you know gamers seem so willing to accept that when mm -hmm. it comes to video games, mm -hmm. but yet there's, there's certainly plenty of people that have trouble when it comes to um, foreign films that mm -hmm. might use that structure. Yeah. So what uh -huh, do you think uh -huh. the reason is that gamers are much more willing to do that for video games? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's what Chris just said, that, that it has a tendency to be a little more experiment, or experiential. Yeah. Um, so you're, ex you're actually exp you're, you're expecting to experience well, because video games versus... Mm -hmm. yeah, um, you're, well, I'm reminded of what Eric Brody of uh, Polynight said mm -hmm. a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. uh, that whenever he sits down in an open world game, he decides beforehand whether or not it's going to be an exploration night or it's going to be a story night. And that really hit me. That mm -hmm. stuck with me when he said that, because I, I realized that I played the entire Horizon Zero Dawn with that mentality. And so as I think back on that play experience, which wasn't nearly as satisfying as it could have been or should have been, mm -hmm. what I realize is that there was a dis disconnection and disjointedness mm -hmm. between the narrative, which was very clearly in a Freytag's Triangle kind of a way, um, and a, in a Western monomyth uh, kind of thing, mm -hmm. compared to the explorative elements and the side quests, which were very much done in this Eastern style. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering if there's a, a way that they could be blended better, or if that was even conscious or not, or is, if it's just a meta, you know, a metaphor or a model that mm -hmm. that applies. Well, I think another as opposed to a design uh, strategy. And I think another yeah. reason, actually, that gamers might be a little bit more open to this in their games, especially, is that we 
games from the start, there is this give and take between Western and Eastern culture. We grew up with some of like the all-time classics coming from Japan. Right. Um, so they came into this with their own point of view and their own sense of narrative and experience that ended up translating to games, but that also just became part of our game vocabulary because they were there right from the start. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, if you're talking about our storytelling traditions, there was a very long time when we didn't even have any access, really, to Eastern storytelling. And only now are we starting to get that mix. Yeah. And there's a little bit of, like, a culture back and forth, but still there's a very distinct line, generally speaking, between Western-style storytelling and Eastern-style storytelling. Well, no, that's a good point. I'll, I'll quote a different guest. Mm-hmm. Uh, frequent guest GM, Will Parsons, mm-hmm. has said that the frustration that he had with Fallout 4 mm-hmm. came in from this idea that he wished the main storyline just hadn't been there at all. Mm-hmm. And that the mod that where you can just turn off the main storyline mm-hmm. for, say, uh, Skyrim, mm-hmm. for example, right. that's, that's totally the way that he plays these games. Now working within this framework of, um, you know, which, which of these are we, are we doing, the mm-hmm. Eastern or the Western model... Uh, it makes me think that we've got these really great exploration games, these really great explorer game types like myself, mm-hmm. um, games, and then we shoehorn in this plot mm-hmm. that has to, we think, follow this Western model mm-hmm. of the monomyth. Yeah, right. Instead of organically allowing the stuff that happens to happen around Mm -hmm. the story that's being told. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were talking earlier, um, I I think this very topic came up um, a couple episodes ago when we were comparing um, uh, Breath of the Wild and Horizon Zero Dawn. Yes. Breath of the Wild is this very sort of open thing, and it it has story, but you sort of, like, unlock the story bits as part of your adventures, Mm -hmm. just incidentally, and you kind of have, like, these little subplots that come up as, and again, this is all optional content. You don't have to do any of the Divine Beasts if you don't want to. But in the process of getting through a Divine Beast um, storyline, so to speak, yeah. story arc, um, you you get some of the story and you develop some of these characters. That makes sense. But it's kind of in this organic, like, I'm going on this adventure sort of way, and all these story things are coming through organically. Yeah. Um, not as you know, uh, a plot point, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Like, mm-hmm. it's not, okay, let's do some plot and then go back to open world and then some plot and open world. I have heard a little bit of complaints about the snapshots. They're called snapshots? I never got uh, that far. Mementos. I mementos. Think. Yeah. They're basically like little uh, you, cut, you, cut scenes. Yeah, you, like, you go to a place and basically you get a flashback. Flashback. It's, you're, you're, memories. Because, yeah, because mm-hmm. Link wakes up without his memories, there, there are ways you can get his memories back. Right. And it, you can unlock... A little bit more of an ending if you want, if you get okay. all of his memories. So that's all it is, but it's a hundred percent optional. Right, but my understanding is that there's one that's really close to like the castle, the main mm-hmm. castle, and if you get a little too close, it triggers basically the what what should be the ending animation, but isn't. Um, where it's like, oh, there's a big fight going on. I don't want to give too much away because it's a new game, mm-hmm. but there's a big fight going on, and um, you you feel the urgency of wanting to stop that fight and and solve the puzzle and save the world. But the reality is, no, I'm going to go uh, cook more peppers. Mm-hmm. I'm going to kill more hobgoblins. I'm going to go. You know, well, yeah, and it's I didn't even really feel from, that either. To you be didn't honest. feel that no. even from the beginning of the game. They kind of hint that there is urgency that you need to stop Ganon before Zelda's power gives out. Yeah. Um, but she's been holding him off for a hundred years. Right. And so, like, there's urgency that, like, this is a thing that I need to go do, but it's not like, oh, man, we only have three days before yeah. this happens. It, it, that it's not presented that way. Okay. It's presented that she's she's been holding him off for a while. Her power will run out, but it's not like you need to go there immediately. In fact, the game tells you over and over again, you're too weak to win now. You have to power up. Mm-hmm. You should go get you should go defeat okay. the divine beast. You should go explore and get more powerful. Maybe you should get that master sword. Mm-hmm. You know, it does things like that to kind of nudge you along. And in, in doing so, in order to do all of that, you have to get you have to get pretty far in the game to have all of this. You know what's funny is if Final Fantasy 15 had said just something along those lines, mm-hmm. I might have bought in a little more into yeah. the fantasy of the narrative as opposed to the narrative of the mm-hmm. fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I've, I've just said the thing about, like, oh, you only have three days to do this. Well, cue Majora's Mask, which is, like, yeah, great pro- example. probably, like, you know, gameplay-wise, I mean, Breath of the Wild is just brilliant. But I still think that if I had to pick my single favorite Zelda for a number of reasons, mm. it still is Majora's Mask. Wow. That's my um, least favorite. I that's my that least one. favorite. I don't like it. <laughs> Absolutely hated um, that one. Yeah, I really actually that, don't like that it. That one does have the, the, the time limit. And so there is this, like, sort of forced sense of urgency, but it loops. And the fact that it loops really kind of takes away the sense of the word you're looking for there, Chris, is resets, okay, yeah, which resets. is extremely frustrating. Okay, mm-hmm. resets. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's I, I never had a hard time kind of adapting my play style to deal with the reset. Yeah, I just learned the system and then did what I had to do. But 
basically what that lets you do is the fact that you know that you can do this an infinite number of times lets you feel free to explore still. Uh, you sort of sense. have a different objective each time you go through it. Um, and so, again, we go back to that experiential idea of, you know, you kind of have each of these, like, little tiny plot threads that are each kind of in their, doing their own thing. And then by the time you finish the game, the entire experience of having done 20 different stories, if I'm just throwing out a random number, sure. all gets contextualized by, you know, saving the world. In the, in the very end. And I think that's exactly what they were going for with mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Just in your saying in, it, in that way mm-hmm. makes me realize, again, that's, that's the Eastern model of mm-hmm. storytelling. Yeah. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. And so it can, be, it can be applied in a lot of different ways. It can be understood in a lot of different ways. But I thought it was just an interesting point to bring up to kind of say, you know, are, are games, generally speaking, closer to this sort of experience than to the Western yeah, and, experience? And I think that generally we're kind of, the consensus seems to be yes. Except maybe if we're talking well, a more le- linear... Mechanically, yes. Yeah, mechanically, mechanically, yes. yes. Design, like design in terms of, mm-hmm. the, you know, maybe level design, the way you're getting, getting power-ups mm-hmm. and how you, how you interact with the game, sure. Mm-hmm. When it comes to story, no. It depends on the game. A lot, most, game. We, yeah. most Western games, I would say, follow the typical mm-hmm. freight text triangle yeah. model. Yeah. When yeah. it comes to just the story, mm-hmm. when they choose to have that, you know, have that story, that mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like that's more of a focus. Yeah. You know, I really like uh, Cal Bashir's work because he takes freight text triangle and also monomyth and basically pulls it into a two-stage process. He says that there's the world, and then there's the underworld or mm-hmm. the other world. Mm-hmm. And once you cross over to that threshold, then you're in the other place, you're going for the boon, and you bring it back into the regular world. Now, that's the simplest, simplest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I like that idea because he builds upon it. Um, big fan of Cal Bashir. Mm-hmm. I think this was a was definitely a good talk, a good thing to, to bring up and kind of work through. Mm-hmm. Um, looking at different ways to present story. Yeah. And so for any of you who are uh, ever, you know, happen to be watching a Japanese film or something like that and are kind of wondering why it feels so different, maybe mm-hmm. this will help you understand that a little bit. Um, you know, that, Ooh, those Japanese films, I can't handle them. <laughs> those that, get it. In fact, that, that article that I was mentioning earlier that had the, the four-panel comic <laughs> example um, was talking about the idea of a, a story without a conflict. Um, and again, I, I would say that Spirited Away has conflicts in there, but they're not what's driving the story necessarily. Um, and I think that might be kind of like the thing that throws off Western audiences is the fact that there's not that sort of like central driving element. Um, and therefore, it sort of feels a little bit meandering, a little bit loose. Um, you know, you think a little bit actually about our, um, our paragraph style. You know, it's, it's very rigid and we don't have to follow it to a T, but basically true, yeah. we introduce the idea... We reinforce that idea, and we have the conclusion that sort of drives it all home. Yeah, it's a very straightforward, very direct way of doing things, and that's that's good sometimes. That's sometimes what we need. Um, I'll have to check my contract, but as the writing tutor of Houston Baptist University, I may be compelled to <laughs> say, "No, that's correct." <laughs> gotcha. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it kind of just depends on you know use the the right story structure. Um, or the right way of thinking for your needs. Know what it is, what you're trying, what what it is you're going for, and of course these these also aren't like hard and fast rules. They're more guidelines. They're tools you can use to help you think about, you know, either the story you're creating or the story that you're trying to experience or to understand. Here the whole time I just thought it was radiation, nuclear bombs. Too soon. Direct all hate mail uh, to <laughs> inbox at backward. Da- Too dash soon. Paddle. <laughs> I really don't think we should be encouraging hate mail. Uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 98 of the Backward-Compelp.com podcast, our discussion on Kisho Tinkets. I'm Chris. I am the lovable Jim. And I'm the guy who cannot pronounce Kinsho T-Sets. Yeah. E- e- Eastern model of uh, storytelling. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.